you know that the United States has the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world? Because severe childbirth complications have become very rare, it is easy to forget that childbirth can be life-threatening. Amanda Groh, a wife and mother of four children, one daughter and three sons, experienced an extremely rare complication of childbirth known as amniotic fluid embolism, which has a mortality rate of as high as 80%. 80%. Stay tuned today to hear about her rapid blood transfusion that nearly drained the hospital's blood supply and left her in a medically induced coma for a week. Stories are our lives in language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee, and I'm excited for our future together of telling stories, evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Story power serves you best when you know how to use it. Amanda's story today isn't just about a miracle and the healing of her body. It's also about the toll such an event takes on us mentally as well as physically And today we're looking at that total process of finding meaning and brokenness and the process of rebuilding. Amanda is the owner of Strategic ACT Prep, a business she built over 10 years that helps high school students prepare for standardized tests. At the time of her medical crisis that we're talking about today, she had 12 employees and three locations. And the crisis necessitated major life changes as it took many months for her to regain mental and physical functioning. So she and her business partner decided that they needed to shut down all three locations and let the employees go. In the aftermath of the crisis, Amanda has also experienced mental health challenges, ones that are characteristic to post-intensive care syndrome, situational depression and post-traumatic stress from everything that her body went through and that her mind has gone through. She's also struggled through a deep identity crisis, which is totally understandable as she no longer has the energy to be the do-it-all mom and the business owner and the community member that she once was. Amanda has a bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University and a master's degree from the University of Utah. She and her husband now serve on the Patient and Family Advisory Council for Intermountain Medical Center. And today she's joining us to tell us her story of what happened to her, the complete miracle of how she got through it, which I don't even think that she understands that. And then that process of the rebuilding, rebuilding out of a space that just lays you flat physically and mentally. So Amanda, welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. It is such an honor to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, first of all, we want to know who you are, and then we want to hear the story of what happened to you in the hospital. So who was the Amanda before all of this started? Deeply ambitious, I think would be a word that's described me since I was a child. I had big plans for the things I wanted to do to change the world, and I didn't really believe in trade-offs. I thought I could do it all. I thought I could be the mom that's there for everything that shows up and, and volunteers and is there for my kids and that I could also have this really satisfying career. I own a business, as you mentioned, and I was growing that business and finding a lot of fulfillment, satisfaction. I was also very involved in my church community. And then at the time of my crisis, I was serving as the leader of all the children, the primary president. So I had a lot going on in my life. It sounds like you were doing it all. I I was I was trying. And and I think no one ever feels like they're successfully doing everything. In retrospect, it's easy for me to think that I was. At the time, of course, I saw my shortcomings and I saw that, that no one can be everything all at once. But I had a tremendous amount of energy and I also was able to function really well and not a lot of sleep. And I just was going full steam ahead. That sounds very superhero-ish. <laughs> well, I, I guess in my own mind, and I guess a lot of us in our own minds, we want to be our the superhero in our story and save the day. I remember having a conversation with my business partner a few weeks of when I was pregnant and we were making plans. And she said, you do remember that you're going to be having a baby at the beginning of March, right? And I said, yeah, but I, I really think, you know, I'm, I'm pretty quick on recovery. 
and you know, we can schedule all these things. <laughs> and I was due on March 9th and I've never, babies have never come early for me. We've always had to coax them out about a week after their due date with mm-hmm. the being induced. So I thought there was no chance in the world this baby would come early. And that week uh, that he did end up coming was just packed full of responsibilities and events. And I had a meeting with some venture capitalists who were potentially interested in investing in my business. And I had big presentations. Uh, That week is also the week of the statewide ACT, which for us in our business, that's kind of like the climax of a year's worth of work. So it was a a big week and I was excited that I was going to get through it and then have a baby and take a couple weeks off and then just bounce right back. So what happened? That is an interesting question because I actually have no memories. My memories are wiped out for about 24 hours before this happens. But this is the account as it's been pieced together by all of my relatives and family stories. But it was a normal Saturday and... I just had been feeling miserable all day, but still trying to square my shoulders and be a good mom and be a good wife. My husband was doing some remodeling project upstairs. We've been remodeling our our upstairs and we were living in the basement downstairs. But apparently I just kind of had enough indications of labor that we decided to go to the hospital about 11 o'clock that night. So my mom came over, my husband and I went to the hospital and I was in labor and I wasn't progressing well, but the baby's heart rate continued to drop and to a point that they said that they didn't want me to go home. They wanted to make sure that baby was delivered. They talked to me about a C-section and I'd never had a C-section before. And I was just very concerned, of course, about making sure my baby got out safe. So they, so we made the decision to do the C-section. C-section went, went well. I didn't have a high-risk pregnancy. There was no real red flags, anything might go wrong. So they delivered the baby. So the C-section was completed. They moved me back into the recovery room. And my husband asked, do you want me to stay with you or do you want me to go to the nursery and give the baby a bath? And this is just something we'd done with all of our kids. He'd been there to give the baby their first bath. And I wasn't feeling really well, but I just said, yeah, go give the baby a bath. I'm okay. But by the time he came back, My room was filled with doctors and nurses, and he knew that something was off. They were kind of all moving frantically around the room. They were just not quite sure what to do, but my blood pressure was plummeting at this point. And the doctors and nurses were trying to decide if they should take me back into the operating room because they could tell there might be some kind of internal bleeding or if they should take me to the shock trauma ICU. And in that deliberation, you know, of course, there's time spent and, and I can't even imagine being a doctor and trying to make calls like that. But during that deliberation, Brian looked over at the anesthesiologist and he said, there's something wrong. And anesthesiologist at that moment just said, we're going now. And he grabbed my bed and he just cut through all those doctors and nurses and he threw the oxygen tank at my husband and they just started running at full speed to the shock trauma ICU. And as they were running, I slipped into unconsciousness and this doctor started slapping my face over and over again and saying, Amanda, stay with us, stay with us. You've got to stay with us. But I, I slipped into unconsciousness and they ran through those halls. They jammed my bed onto the elevator and they went up the elevator and they came running out. And by that time, the notification call had come through to shock trauma and there were about 25 doctors and nurses waiting and they all just descended on me. And my husband just described it as the most organized chaos he's ever seen, where they were moving in and out, checking things, administering things, hooking things up to me. They intubated me because I had, you know, my lungs just had stopped functioning. And an EKG test that was done on my heart during kind of that time um, showed that my heart was still beating, but there was no blood left in my heart. And a few of the doctors and nurses there said that they'd never seen that before. They'd never seen a heart that was beating with no blood in it. There was a massive blood transfusion. My husband was standing over in the corner through all of this, and he just said, 
that they kept running in with coolers of blood and they just, (laughs) the person running in with the coolers of blood just kept saying, who's going to sign for the blood? Who's going to sign for the blood? But the doctors and everyone with that authority was so focused on stabilizing me that no one would sign for the blood. And finally, my husband said, well, can I sign for the blood? And and uh, anyway, finally, a doctor came and signed for the blood and they, they began this rapid transfusion and they stabilized me enough to, for surgery. Meanwhile, my OBGYN who had left after the delivery of the baby because it was four in the morning, he had been called back in, he was there. And so my two OBGYNs and they took me back for surgery to see they, they could tell the blood was pooling somewhere, but they just, uh, and they suspected it was in my uterus. So uh, they took me back to surgery and during that surgery did an emergency hysterectomy to try to stop the bleeding. And my OBGYN, Dr. Stephen Terry, who had been an OBGYN for 37 years, said that he'd never seen anything like this. He, he gave me the hyster they did the hysterectomy, but the bleeding didn't even begin to stop. I was just still bleeding out of control. And he said at that point, he just kind of put his hands up and said, this one has passed me. I, I haven't seen this before and I don't know what's happening. So he called out for the trauma surgeons at the hospital and One of the miracles is that those trauma surgeons were just steps away. They were already there on this really early Sunday morning and the top trauma surgeons at the hospital. And they came in and for the next several hours, they pumped blood into me and tried to kind of suture all of the veins that were bleeding out of control. And I just kept bleeding out and they'd get one vein, you know, they get one area stabilized and then another area would just start bleeding out of control. And what was happening to me is a rare kind of blood clotting emergency known as DIC, which is, it officially stands for disseminated intravascular coagulation, but unofficially doctors and nurses have said that DIC stands for death is certain. It's just so almost impossible to stop the bleeding when the clotting factors go out of control like this. And my DIC was caused by something known as amniotic fluid embolism. And AFE happens when amniotic fluid gets into the mother's bloodstream and just causes a chain reaction of terrible events that have been very deadly in the past. Doctors are becoming increasingly aware of this rare complication and so and able to administer uh, the kind of treatment that AFV victims need, but there's still a very high death rate for this complication. So a couple of hours pass and my husband's just in the waiting room and has, he said it was the worst, the most terrible hours of his life. And uh, while he's in the waiting room, the nurses from the nursery, who had no idea any of this had happened, finally found him and said, oh, Mr. Groh, we just needed you to know that your baby's been upgraded to the NICU. And so he was torn in half between two places where he didn't know if he should be there waiting, but just totally helpless in the waiting room for me to find news about me, or if he should be back trying to see if he needed to be there for the baby who had been having some health problems and was upgraded to the NICU. So is that your daughter? My youngest is a son. So my okay. oldest is a daughter, and then I have three boys. Okay. And so this is my little boy. So my husband waited. And during that time, a social worker came in. Uh, By this time, my parents had arrived. A social worker came in to tell them that I was actively dying and that they needed to kind of prepare for the worst. And that made my husband really angry. (laughs) He didn't want that social worker there. He just, it was just a really painful symbol to him. Anyway, hours later, the surgeons come out and say that I'm alive, I'm stabilized, but just barely. And they left my wound site open because they thought the bleeding was likely to continue and they would need to go back in again. So they actually suppressed like the bleeding with a balloon, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like a kind of a medical balloon that applied enough pressure on the veins that they stopped bleeding. I was moved back into a room of the shock trauma and they told my husband that he could come see me, but that I that he needed to prepare himself because I would not look anything like myself. And so he came back and doctors have described this to me as like 
when you are bleeding out of control like that, it's like your entire body is covered in a bruise because the blood flows throughout your body. So your entire body bruises and swells. And so I was swollen beyond recognition. And my husband said that, you know, if he hadn't known it was me, he would not have recognized me. And so I'm swollen and bruised. And during the next few days, as they weighed me at shock trauma, I was twice my body weight. In, in wow. just and so I weighed about 300 pounds. This situation, the news is starting to spread. And one day as a nurse came in you know, right near the beginning, I think on that very first day, a nurse came in and watched my husband and my mom just trying to reply to messages and update people about what was happening to me. She said, you'll never be able to stay ahead of it. You'll never be able to reply to all the people that are going to want to know what's going on. And she said, my suggestion is that you do a Facebook page to keep everyone updated. And that way you don't have to constantly be replying to individuals. You can send everybody to one place to find out what's going on. And so they created a Facebook page called Miracles for Amanda Grow and just pleaded for everyone that we knew to pray that I would be able to survive. And so the news spread. And I think especially this story struck a chord with people because there was a tiny baby involved. And it makes me want to cry to think about it. But I think within all of our hearts, we want a mother to be able to be with her baby, a baby to be able to be with his mother, and and not to mention the, the three kids at home who, you know, woke up in the morning to find a few tear-stained relatives who were really uncertain about how to tell the kids what was going on and, you know, lead with the good news. They told them, you know, you have a new baby brother, and they showed him some pictures, and but, you know, my daughter said that she saw some of our relatives at, kind of went into one of the bedrooms to pray. And, you know, everyone had kind of red eyes and tears in their eyes. And she was really, really confused. And she made the deduction, well, if they're showing me pictures of my baby brother and he looks okay, there must be something wrong with my mom. Back in the hospital, I'm in a medically induced coma. You know, they just don't know what's going to happen at this point. These these are rare cases, and with any kind of an emergency like this, they don't know if the patient will ever really regain consciousness, and they also don't know what the patient is going to be like when they regain consciousness, because I could never regain kind of my mental functioning. There's also the possibility of kind of paralysis, never regaining physical functioning. But the worries about like actual paralysis were were maybe not as strong because as they would adjust my medications to try to see if they could get me to kind of emerge from this, to kind of regain consciousness, as they kind of pulled back the sedation meds, I would thrash around. And my parents and my husband said it was the most excruciating, awful thing they'd seen because my hands were tied to the bed, but I'm intubated, right? I have a tube down my throat and it's a really natural reaction that if you you have a tooth down your throat, you're going to, if you have anything in your throat, you're going to try and get it out. And so as those sedation meds were adjusted, I fought and fought and fought against restraints and thrashed around until, and my family said, even though it was good to see me moving, they were always so relieved when they turned the sedation meds back up and I would calm down. And so over time, nurses and doctors just worked on trying to get the mix of medications right. And I think it was ultimately like some anti-anxiety meds as they pulled back the sedation meds that finally let me emerge into like a state of consciousness that wasn't like frantic fighting. (laughs) But during this time, as the story is spreading on Facebook, my family chose a day and a time when they asked everyone to pray at 11.15 on Friday. And actually today is the anniversary of that Friday. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a tender moment. It's a tender day. But yeah. uh, at 11.15, they asked everyone to pray for me. And even my dentist office, I later found out, turned off the music and all of the staff held a moment of silence. 
and the just strangers, people I don't know, like a group of people in Africa that somehow found out about this, prayed and sang and did all kinds of things to try to like plead for heaven to help me emerge from this coma to be with my children. Wow. And that's it, really beautiful. It's, that it still baffles me. And I still feel like I'm just one little person. Like I can't believe that like humanity is so good and so kind that like people would put this kind of like emotional, mental, physical effort into doing these things for me. And one of my friends rallied people to release yellow balloons and, you know, people released balloons and prayed. And I emerged into a very strange, wonderful, beautiful, but strange reality. So it was the next day that, you know, the anti-anxiety medication and the sedation medication found the right balance and the miracle of emerging started to take place. Those first few hours were really, really calm. And I almost wonder if it's maybe my newborns, you know, after they get their lungs functioning and they, they kind of calm down from that, they've always been really calm for just a short amount of time. And I almost wonder if that's what it feels like is my brain didn't have a lot of function to worry. So I didn't wonder like, where am I? Why am I in the hospital? What's going on? I was just really calm. And I recognized my family members and they were so happy and I couldn't quite understand why. But it was kind of like a blurry picture coming in and out of focus. But over time, you know, as I start to kind of regain, as things start really coming into focus, I remember my dad asking me some questions. And this is one of my earliest memories. He just said, are you, Amanda, are you a business owner? And I said, yes. And then he said, are you the primary president? And I said, yes. And then he said, are you remodeling your house? And I said, yes. And allegedly, I flashed him a look like, dad, how could I possibly forget that terrible part of my life? And then he said, do you have a new baby? And that is when the panic set in because I didn't remember a baby and I didn't even remember being pregnant. So I started to feel really worried because if there was a baby, I felt like what happened and why, what else do have I forgotten? And so my husband one time asked if I wanted to see a picture of the baby and I shook my head. No. And, but my mom didn't ask. She just would put pictures in my line of sight. And if I had use of my arms, I would have pushed them away because I was so terrified did you find out why you don't remember that and how long uh, did it take so, you to remember it? Yeah. The sedation medication, it's kind of a milky color, apparently. I'm not medical. I don't really know. But the, this is what's been told to me. is they, It's kind of a milky color and they nickname it milk of amnesia because there's just parts. There's just some things that you're going to forget. There's just some parts that are wiped out of memory. And within a day, I had memories come back to me that, oh, yes, I remember I was pregnant. But I still, to this day, don't remember going to the hospital, being in labor, the delivery of the baby, even though I was conscious during all of that time, there's still just the memories are completely blank. It's interesting how trauma does that. I had a a rock climbing accident, you know, 20 years ago, but I was dropped from the top of a a hundred foot cliff. And I remember the release of the rope, right? And I remember that feeling of falling backwards. And then I remember laying at the bottom just in so much pain and cussing, you know, like, oh, shit, that's really, you know, and I don't remember anything else. Like I've recreated what it must have felt like to bounce down those um, rock spires, uh, you know, and Uh. puncture wounds all over my body. But I don't even remember the ambulance ride. I don't remember getting to the hospital. There's just all of that stuff that and you try to fill it in. But I think when trauma is involved, that your brain automatically blocks a lot of what you're going through. I agree. And I think it's so interesting how our brains really do want to reconstruct it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me saying like, maybe I do remember that, but I've really come to terms with, you know, and, and it's blurry, right? I don't know what parts I really remember and what parts are reconstructed, but, but I know that those things have been told to me of the baby's birth and then the labor 
paper and all the things leading up in my mind, they still really are quite blank, but it is interesting. And other trauma survivors I've talked to have said similar things that there's just blank. It's just blank. And it, I don't know if it's the brain needing to protect itself against uh, storing those memories. I don't know. Stay tuned next week for the rest of Amanda's story. So often here on the podcast, we're talking about recovering from accidents, loss, death. The stories we tell here are always about the victors who find their way out of the dark and they shine a light for us so that if we are having similar experiences, we can learn from their stories. Amanda's story is right in the middle and it gets more intense before it gets, before it concludes. And to be real honest, it doesn't really conclude. That space of physical and mental recovery is something that continues onward. But join us next week for the rest of her story and find out what happens and find out how she hits those or how she combats those dark spaces that she gets spun into. Your challenge this week is to think about your own journey. Is there a space or time where you have had some trauma? and where there has been an expectation for quick healing. And think about that because we're going to readdress that when we come back next week. Of course, the Love Your Story podcast website is always available for you for tuning in to past episodes, for buying t-shirts, for getting a copy of my new book, The Life, Living Intentional and Fearless Every Day, The 21 Life Connection Challenges. Or you can hop on Amazon and buy it. But the website is there to serve you and provide you with tools and more episodes. So thank you for being here today. We'll see you next week for the rest of the story.